Ready? So, good afternoon again, and um, we are in this last part of this intensive day talking uh, in, the, in the summer group of straining European identity through culture and education and how to manage it. And this specific topic we choose on international cultural cooperation and its cultural dimension. We are going to switch a little bit the conversations from this morning, maybe a lot. <laughs> But um, we are going now a little bit into practice, and uh, we have with that uh, with us uh, Inger uh, Thurstermans, which is uh, managing director of the Festival Academy, which is an initiative of the European Festival Association. She works as general manager for the Brussels-based artist company Neat Company under the artistic direction of uh, Jan Laubers for almost ten years. And in 2012, uh, he left uh, this, this company to manage Atelier for Young Festival uh, Managers, which is an initiative of the, of the European Festival Association, which is a network, um, an organization of more than 100 festivals in Europe and beyond Europe, which is very important to underline this question of beyond Europe. In 2012, she set up a new uh, non-profit organization, the Festival Academy, as an initiative of the European Festival Association, which developed into a regular training offer for festival managers worldwide on the artistic side as well as on the production uh, side. And uh, well, uh, we were having a little discussion yesterday night when she arrived here around midnight. Uh, and of course, we wanted to introduce the questions of uh, festivals here uh, because we think it's a very good example on uh, how they are trans transmitters, we could say, of the, the, the tools that uh, culture use um, to transmit what is culture, in fact, but in a way very special because uh, as an example we were telling just okay when you go to the cinema or you go to a concert you just go with your partner with your, your, your family and that's it you enjoy the performance you enjoy the artistic thing and that's it but in the case of festivals when you go to a festival you interact with people so it has a double income for you the artistic part but also the social part on top of that she's training managers to do that. So looking forward very much to hearing to you. Thank you, Inger, for being here. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, the first woman speaker no. today. 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 <laughs> and I counted there are four female speakers on 14 speakers in total. but. And it's uh, the last session of the afternoon, so bear with me a little bit. Uh, I think uh, the, the temperature in the room has been rising due to the conversations, uh, but also literally. And we've been listening a lot. So I want to actually start with um, a game to, you know, like just uh, move a little bit. So the rules of the game are very simple. Uh, you see there uh, papers, you have agree, strongly agree, disagree and strongly disagree and uh, I will put a statement on um, the PowerPoint and I will uh, read it also and you have to choose a position and then I will ask a few of you to yeah, to say why you uh, stand where you stand and if you listen to the other people and you change your mind in the course of the exercise you can move also to another position if you want. So yeah, let's all get up. And can I have uh, the PowerPoint on the... Alex, the PowerPoint, please. Uh, are you going to move? Yeah. Do you want this micro? Yes, that's good. So I will read the first one. It's about European identity. European identity does not exist and is a term used to feed nationalistic feelings replicating the focus on national identity in many member states today.
Do you all take positions? So I'll, I'll go to the most brave ones who took like a very <laughs> brave position. Can you say why you agree? Because, I agree because European doesn't have a unique identity, but they have European have a diversity in identity. It is the reason other country, other part of Europe try to to influence is identity. It is the reason that I can say I'm agree. You want to add something to that? Uh, we talked about what are the qualities of a European identity, like freedom of speech, uh, human rights, speech, uh, freedom of religion, things like that. And if you make them exclusive for Europe, I think you are acting in the wrong way. Could we talk about a global identity, yeah. maybe? Exactly. So, uh, are you all in the disagree or in the strongly disagree? <laughs> so, uh, where is the middle? I, I will go to the strongly disagree. Okay, um, I'm strongly disagree because, of course, there is not a unique European identity. But I think that our diversity, our diversity in culture, in heritage, is our identity, and they have a common base: freedom, democracy, um, love of arts in general. We are here because of that. Thank you. Don't, don't they have that also in the states or in Asia or in? Don't they have that also in the States, or the, the things that you mentioned now, are that... The first time I really felt European was the first time I was in USA. Okay. Somebody wants to add on that? Yeah, the same here. I have been living in the States for seven years, and I have more to do with you who are from Holland, and we, live, we have different languages, and someone from Oregon, really. It's the way of thinking, the way of um, eating, the way of behaving, a lot of things. Okay. Somebody maybe of the... I have another one here. Why, why are you, for example, in the, in the disagree group and not in the strongly disagree? Can you yeah, for example, the I don't believe in identities, in strong identities. I think all of them are construction. But in cases, case for Picasso, we cannot understand Picasso without the the age uh, he lived in Paris. He, he was an European. Also, for example, Kafka from Czech Republic. He wrote in German language. So I think European identity is not a strong identity, but it exists. So, and also the, the sentence, we, we can say just the opposite. We can say Padania nation identity doesn't insist that it is against Italian identity. So I think this sentence is so relative. Did anybody change that? You moved? Yeah. You, were, you were there. <laughs> so wh why did you move? <laughs> I'm, I'm not moving, I'm just, I, I will be but I'm not you, but you can also be in the middle if you don't yeah. know, for example. Yeah. But the, the things I am uh, um, in, this, in, this, in this part, because I always uh, observe wh uh, when I was in, in Dominican Republic in Haiti, I always when the, the government of France going to do something, they don't talk a lot about the open. When the Spanish government do something, they don't talk about the open. They on, uh, like the British government, they don't talk about the open. The other country, all, all, always, all of other country know about three country, like three country and, and Europe. But the other one, the other all, all the country, for for them, they know, they they don't know exactly if after three three this country if exist other country in Europe. But that's the reason I think uh, it's better I take this part. So you, European identity is maybe only reflecting the culture of one or three, three countries. Country. Yeah. Thank you. So I will go to the next statement, which which also talks about uh, identity, but in a in a different uh, context. Um, the cultural and academic boycott of Israel, as called for by the Palestinian people, should be supported by all artists. 
Do you understand it? Is there an Israeli or a Palestinian in the room, actually? No? Nobody? Do you understand uh, the statement? You know about uh, the... You know that Palesti Palestinians are don't have their clear identity recognized by Israel or by any other um, state for that matter. So there is a boycott by some of, some of the artists say like, we don't want to play there because they're occupied by um, Israel. So it's a question about, you know, do you need, do you have a right to have uh, your own identity and should we boycott that as artists? Or should, or should you, should you continue? Um, is it more important to continue the conversation, apart from the fact whether whatever the situation is, should you boycott it? So, meaning that you don't go and perform in Israel, or do you have to continue the conversation? Um, because if you boycott it, there will be no conversation at all, and you cannot influence anybody. That's the question, actually. Sorry if it was not clear. There is a fly. Uh. I don't think that a boycott will work. Uh, that's why I strongly disagree about uh, taking the boycott as a political instrument. Sorry. You're excluding yourself from the discussion, so uh, always try to be within the discussion. And thanks to Graceland, uh, there was also a boycott, and Paul Simon had shit about the boycott, and looks what happened. So the boycott is not an instrument that's working. But how then to change uh, the, the occupation or, or the situation? Go there and find your podium, right? Go, go into discussion. Yeah. Go for the political debate. Do something. But when you're not going there, then you exclude yourself from the discussion. So you have to be part of it. So go there, and of course, and, and uh, let's t find a position to, to, to give freedom to your voice. Can you have an equal conversation when you are occupied? Do you want to say something because you're nodding your head? Maybe Argentina. I, I didn't know what to choose to say because I didn't understand if it, the boycott. It, the boycott is from Palestinian to Israel because of the occupation. Yeah, it now, it's that as an artist you would not yes. perform in Israel because you support... Yeah. Yes, I totally agree with that. Uh, because, and I, yes, yes. And, <laughs> and I agree because I understand what you say and I think that it's true. But as uh, Inks uh, were, uh, was saying, in the case that it's in uh, an equal discussion, I think that the discussion uh, doesn't exist because of uh, geopolitics and power and because United States are uh, with uh, Israel and all superpowers. So I think that the discussion doesn't even exist. Palestinian isn't, it's almost, uh, isn't uh, recognized from the other countries, so how can the discussion exist? So that's why I strongly agree with, as a way of, I think it's a still a democratic uh, way of expressing, and it's not uh, that bad, as for example, there are worse things to do, as for example, the economical uh, uh, decisions that are taken against other countries, I think that are much worse than doing a boycott. Yeah, I disagree because I think that if you boycott some population, that means that you're generalizing the action of the of the whole population, and there are a lot of people that thinks uh, different, uh, that have uh, different opinions, and to be Israeli, Israeli is to be to have a um, 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 nation nationality. So it's like a political statue, not an ideological or cultural or I neither ident identification. So maybe there are Israel people that don't like they they support Palestinians. So you shouldn't boycott them if y they self um, support Palestinians. One last. 
I agree with her, and I think that they that people have to make action um, because of the occupation. So um, um, we need to act. But I think that boycott is not boycott to the artists is not the way because, um, in my opinion, the artists um, are not uh, good are not guilties. So m maybe this is why I just disagree and no strongly agree or agree yeah, because of the way. I don't think like Hobbes that, well, it's okay. I, I, uh, just, just one remark. Why do you expect from sporters that they are not involved in politics, world championship in whatever country, and look also uh, uh, our Freak de Jonge in 1974 already with Argentina, and why do we always have this discussion that culture should be, or artists should be part of politics. Maybe we should try also, does, as sports, we recognize the independence of sportsmen and a culture, we mix them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we go to the next one. It's, it's, it's a game. Funding, to talk about money. Ethical funding is a luxury for those who have access to resources. Do you know what I mean by ethical funding? Ethical funding is uh, whether you decide or, you know, in, in many of the programs that I lead, there is a discussion about do you take money from a certain government you don't agree with or do you take money for a cert from a certain oil company. And here uh, the, the, um, the statement is that that is a, a luxury actually for people who have, who work in Europe, who are subsidized to think about that. But if you work, for example, in Africa, you might not have the luxury to consider ethical funding. <laughs> Just take a position. Yo no me estoy quedando bien de lo que era ética de Mira, que por ejemplo, que a ti te, que un país que paga guerras te da dinero a África. Tú eres un país muy pobre y aceptas dinero de Arabia Saudí que Entonces hace la guerra con... ¿Lo aceptas o no lo aceptas? Aquí dice que es un lujo para aquellos que pueden coger otras, eh, otras, otras opciones. Otras opciones, sí. I go for the lonely one. Strongly agree. I, I don't know <laughs> if I got it. Sorry. I don't know if I got it correctly, but uh, if if it's what I think, uh, then then yeah, it's a total luxury because uh, if you yeah, imagine you're in the Congo and you want to do some kind of. I don't know this thing, but there, then you want to, you need the money, and you ask the African Union. They, yeah, they're going to find it very funny, and uh, but they have bigger problems. So, you know, you cannot ask, you cannot uh, take that luxury of asking who you want to, uh, who you want uh, them to give you the money because you you have no that you don't have that option you just have the option of taking the money from whoever is willing to give it to you you know is is it a way of cleaning money through culture to accept dirty money and to do something good with that it can be and yes yes why not i mean it's better that you use that money for culture than for weapons Right. Somebody from the the disagree. There's nobody who disagrees. It is you do. <laughs> Thank you. No, because the statement doesn't say what you have to what you uh, have to produce in return. Mm -hmm. So. I think it goes back to our discussion yesterday a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah, that's why. This is for me an incomplete um, sentence or statement in that sense, because that's one thing to accept money. And yeah, I, I think so. I think uh, money laundering through culture is, it happens actually. And um, yeah, you should not accept money from everybody, but uh, what do you have to do with it? That's the question. When, the, when that comes up. Anybody wants to add something? Uh? On that still, it's not about formulating the right answer. You know, the exercise is really about just thinking about the complexity. What we've been talking about this morning of certain issues and 
to have a way to talk about it without being aggressive or defensive, but really to just think, you know, this is my position and maybe uh, yeah, when I hear somebody else I might change and to give everybody a little bit the floor to speak about that in a sort of democratic... Yes, please, Miguel. Uh, well, I will be a little bit in the middle. Well, maybe also for the rest of the of the yeah. questions, uh, but in this case, the last one. Uh, in this case, I think uh, we are thinking on um, uh, funding like a big amounts of money, and I think that is a mistake because we can also make ethical money, eth ethical funding by just giving one euro, one dollar, and uh, well, it's something that happens. F uh, a few days ago, there was a call, I think it was from the Prado Museum, mm -hmm. to fund uh, five dollars or five euros uh, to funding uh, something, a project they wanted to, to make. So it's a way of people also to participate, even with just small resources, and also to clean in some way their conscience of uh, I'm contributing in this way because I cannot do it in another way. So. Sometimes when we look at the sentence like that, we have a stereotype in our mind, and we look at it in a, maybe just in our own vision, but we have to be brought in our the, the way we uh, look at these sentences, and the other ones too, and analyze what is behind each word. Yeah. Uh, so, well. It is opinion. really to raise critical awareness, you know, and it, the statements are designed also specifically for that, so you have something like, uh, because maybe, all money is dirty. It's also something you can say. Or, but it, it's just to see, to take different perspectives and to work from that. It was the last one, so please take a seat. Uh, thank you for uh, cooperating. You can put the, the word. I might need it. So as uh, Miguel already said, I work for the European Festivals Association, which is a network of uh, about 100 festivals in Europe and beyond. I need to talk in both of them. Okay. Uh, which started, it's actually the oldest network of festivals in Europe. It started 60 years, more than 60 years ago, after the Second World War. And really from the ideology, it was started by some 15 festivals, like Edinburgh, Aix-en-Provence, uh, Berliner Festspiele, really from the ideology that through culture, through working together, something like a Second World War should never happen again. Uh, today it is a community of, as said, 100 members, also around uh, 700 FA label festivals. That's a quality label that um, we actually, in, in, in function of the European Union, that we allocate to festivals uh, from Europe. So it's a sort of Michelin star for festivals. And uh, the global alumni network of the Festival Academy, which is really, which brings together 580 people from more than 80 countries, so it's bringing together a great diversity of voices and ideas. The Festival Academy, which was initiated in 2012 um, out of the success of one of its training programs, the Atelier for Young Festival Managers, uh, is actually an organization that offers training on festival management, both on the artistic and the production side. So the Atelier, is, the Atelier for Young Festival Managers is for artistic uh, directors to really think about um, uh, what is a festival, what is your vision, uh, how do you relate to your community, how do you work with your audiences, etc., etc. Then we have a program for production managers, which is more the practical side of it, and then we have some smaller formats. But uh, the real idea is to reflect on the role of festivals today in a, in a changing society. Why festivals? Festivals are places of experiment, of risk, um, limited in time and place, but also platforms for change, for action, for society debates, as like the Me Too um, revelation. It brings people together, and it is a place of connection, human connection. I think today what we notice also at the European Festivals Association, but also at the Festival Academy, and we talked about this to this morning also uh, when uh, Mario said cultural heritage itself is at stake. I think also the concept of festivals itself is at stake today. 
everything is a festival. You have a festival of food, of shoes, of, I don't know, you know, like the, the, the term itself is being recuperated. And I think what we try to do um, in these programs is also to define what is a festival and what kind of a quality do you need to be able to talk about uh, an art festival, um, let's say. Um, I, I could talk about what I'm doing, you know, like, but I think you can see that also on the website. So instead, I'm more thinking about talking uh, why I do what I do, um, uh, the vision that I have in doing what I do, uh, the passion and the determination that I, I use to, to, to do this, actually. Um, and I also would like to invite you, because I think I, it's not such, so much a presentation, it's maybe more a keynote I will deliv deliver or a sort of um, raising certain questions. And I want you to think also as an individual, because we said earlier today you are connected and you always act as a group, but I also really believe in the power of an individual to catalyze change or to catalyze change in your communities, in your homes, uh, in your families, whatever. Um, and to think about your role in society. <clears throat> so I have, a, I, I have a few questions, uh, because we're talking here about strengthening, strengthening a European identity, but what does that mean, a European identity? Uh, isn't a European identity exactly diversity, what we've been talking about? Or is, um, why should uh, identity and diversity, why do we talk about it as antagonisms? Why can't it be both in one way or another? And isn't, it, isn't diversity exactly about valuing and respecting each um, and everyone's unique self in one way or another? Um, the refugee crisis, climate change, uh, the challenges on artistic expression of, uh, on expression of freedom today, are these European challenges or is this something that are global challenges today? Can we talk about strengthening a global identity? Think beyond borders. We all know that, for example, with the growth that is currently happening in Africa, that refugees will, be, will, will stay coming to Europe. Is that a problem of Africa or is it a problem of Europe? Europe is certainly worried about it. Um, I think uh, everything we do starts a little bit from the basis that there are two key fault lines in our contemporary world, which are inequality, continuing inequality, and culture. Conflicts rooted in inequality are made more complex by different value and belief systems, which is culture, which are often ignored when seeking solutions. And also, I want to focus on the fact that culture is not always positive. It has been used in many regimes to force apartheid, for example, in South Africa, or to, to enforce certain um, beliefs and cultural structures on people which, which was not theirs in the first place. And from this belief, um, and in a world which is polarized by inequality and culture, there is, according to me, an urgent need for informed, skilled leaders and activists with a global perspective, acting in solidarity to affect change nationally, regionally, and internationally. Um, and I, I want to share a little bit my vision. I mean, I, we have now this Festival Academy and we are running these training programs and we enable actually a global conversation. So people who participate in the, these programs come from all over the world. Um, the activities that we do also take part all over the world. We've been in Asia, in the MENA region. We did the first edition in Africa and I will show you a video uh, just now. Um, <clears throat> really to, to have a global conversation about today's challenges and the role that art and culture can play in these. And it sounds huge and serious, but in the first place, it's actually fun and inspiring. And I will show you um, the video before I talk more about my vision for the future. Um, so these are the different programs. This is the network, so you can see a little bit where we are operating in the world. And the sound is not there. So let's stop this for a moment. I loved every bit of it from the first moment. The design of sharing knowledge, the participation, everybody all inclusive, everybody at some point had something to say. There 
was no participant that did not say something at a particular time. And that to me meant a lot. It built our confidence. We got to know the strengths and weaknesses of each of us and we got to see how to assist everyone in dealing with these issues. My expectations of doing the atelier was really to meet with like minds from around the world and that certainly has, has come true. It was really great having been asked the question about our dream festival before we arrived here in Johannesburg. So to have that was kind of like a dual conversation that ran alongside my thinking throughout the week. The world we live in today has no simple solutions. The challenges we face are quite complicated. And to upskill a network of festival leaders who all have a platform to act and react from is something that is needed and necessary and urgent today so they can also plan their festivals and their programs from a global perspective. We realize that there's a broader conversation globally around the kinds of questions that festival managers are asking here. And I think festivals often take upon themselves the burden of responding to some pretty deep social and political and educational and artistic challenges. It's really wonderful to be strengthening a network, to be making sure that those conversations aren't stuck in one national context, but actually are part of what's happening to change context for art making in the world now. I think to be able to participate in this kind of a program is so un enriching on so many levels. You gain new perspectives, you gain inspiration, but especially you gain uh, a group of new friends. It's seven days, so that's quite long. It's not a two-day conference. And what you take home with you is really this feeling of human connections and the possibility to engage with each other and share in each stories and to collaborate uh, afterwards. Atelier has been such a profound experience and it's so important for the global community, for South Africa and I think most importantly we always get projects coming from Europe and Western and Global North that are about um, benevolence. They always see Africa as a place where we're giving stuff to, you know. And I think what Inga and Lori and, and, and the team have been able to successfully put together is a very circular and, and democratic space where everyone feels like an equal contributing to a global conversation. It just made me dream broader and wider. So. It's, it's way more beyond my expectations. I'm considering about uh, my project in economic dynamics and also po political dynamics before I didn't. I just uh, considering in the artist perspective. For people to leave here having been provoked around some of the key global themes and how those impact on their festivals. And I think to maintain relationships in a post festival and to let what has happened at this particular atelier feed into ateliers of the past in terms of alumni who have graduated from previous academies being alerted you know, to the kinds of themes that have been dealt with here and that this becomes a basis for future academies as well. Apart from all the ateliers that we have in Europe and in Asia in, that we did already in the MENA region, we really try to extend this activity to other regions, other continents, to really enable a global conversation between festival managers. I think the mentors have been excellent as well, I have to say. The openness that they've kind of attended this atelier with and the keenness that they have to answer your questions, share their ideas and give you advice as well because you're talking about people who are at the very top of their game with a lot of experience. That's a gift, you know, a lot of people on this atelier are at the very beginning of their career so to get great advice from people who have 30 years experience face to face, it's very difficult to get that outside of this, this context. It was really useful because it was we're thinking about how do we dream, how do we enact what we want to do and I'm going away with actually some real tangible solutions and operational models that have given me confidence and renewed affirmation of different ways to work and operate um, as a cultural activist and programmer across Africa which is yeah, really great. We have an alumni network today counting 500 people coming from more than 70 countries. It's a really powerful tool in today's world of people, activists, festival leaders coming from all over the world with which you can engage, with which you can work together. Going into Northern Africa because we tend to get... You get the ID, no? It, it, it didn't follow anymore, eh? Yeah. The, the speed... Uh, the sound and the, yeah, was a...
anyway, I think you, you get a little bit the idea. Face to face. They counting 500 people coming from more than 70 countries. It's a really powerful tool in today's world of people, activists, festival leaders. Coming to happen again, so we'll leave it at, uh, at this. It's not. Um, I think you get an idea of, of what this kind of a program does and and how it um, it it connects and. My vision is, in a way, like this is now the Festival Academy, you know, it's linked to, to festivals, but the idea is to develop this actually into an academy for global change, where you bring together people from different fields, from um, social, economic, political. We will line up this program with the Cultural Summit at uh, the former director, Jonathan Mills of the Edinburgh International Festival. He is doing a kind of summit, which is similar to this, which brings like ministers of culture from all over the world together. We will link that up. So to really get the conversation going, where you include several fields uh, of people to, but bottom up, you know, people who are running festivals, who are connected to civil society, and who can share their visions and ideas and influence um, policies and, and civil society on a on a larger scale. That's that's um, uh, the yeah. The, the general idea and as a short-term aim that is to enable a global conversations and make these connections and facilitate this network so they can collaborate with each other. Uh, but on a longer term, it's really to develop a global network of or, or a sort of peaceful army of activists um, to think about alternative visions of the world we live in today, I think. And, it is all about what we talked about this morning, awareness, and also the skill to name certain problems and conflicts and not to be scared of that and to have a safe place where you can have a dangerous conversation with each other. And with the Festival Academy, we are always confronted with the world in the places we travel to. For example, now in the recent atelier in Gothenburg, where there were car burnings in the outskirts of Swedish cities just before we arrived in the run-up of the elections, uh, and the polarized debate on refugees that was going on there. Populist voices rising all over Europe. We've been in Budapest with the atelier, where we clearly could see what the result was of the, of, um, the rule of Viktor Orban on the cultural field, and people were scared to talk about it. We've been in Thailand during the mourning period of their king, uh, Bumibol, and the upcoming junta, and the instability that that, that created. We've been in uh, Beirut in March 2015, where we witnessed ourselves um, what it means for a country as Lebanon, which is 100 times smaller than the EU and quite densely populated with four and a half million inhabitants pro providing shelter to more than one million Syrian refugees, which is 50 times more than the European Union in its totality. Or in Shanghai, where we were uh, during um, the, the election, the, the presidential committee, where you see that all the social media, social media are being shut down at that point and you cannot access anything anymore. So. In our speakers, which for example we had now in Gothenburg, um, Yalmar, who is running a festival in Afghanistan, who just came back from there after a suicide attack, killing 50, 50 young students preparing for their exams, who was uh, performing a play there in the aftermath and burying the people and then coming to the atelier to participate in that, but also in all the countries, in all the histories and all the stories, the participants taking part in these training programs, coming from all the from all over the world represent. Both beautiful and tragic, I think, as being confronted with the world is not only misery, and let's hope that the urgency to act does not only come from negative stories. Within these contexts, what we do is to enable a global conversation, to bring a group of experienced festival leaders, young festival leaders, cultural activists together in these places. And I have to say that when looking at today's world with war messages being tweeted, um, with people speaking out on social media being locked up, as for example Shaidul Alam, and I'm naming all these people, you know, because it's actually part of the network of our friends. It's a Bangladesh photographer who is risking 14 years of jail at this point because he just took pictures of a student uh, protest in um, Bangladesh. 
which we, we've mentioned already, the refugee ships, like now in Marseille, or uh, again, where they are refusing harbor to people in dire need of medical assistance. Uh, with megalomanic leaders making plans for a space force being called to life to dominate infinite space, how crazy can it become? The madness has to stop is something that Jan Maar said following the, um, the Afghanistan bombings, but will it? And what is our role and position in all of this? When following the news, I have to say that I feel lonely or alone in the views and perspectives that I have, but that is not necessarily the case in my close circle of friends or in my work circle. So what does that say about me or what does that say about us? If I could assume that the, the people in this room share the feeling of absurdity at above events, should I then conclude that we have, we, have we failed to bring our message in a language that can be understood by many? Have we failed to be heard and seen? Have we failed to connect and dialogue with people all over the world who have different perspectives? And is democracy obviously harder than we think? As Madeleine Albright, the former US Secretary of State, having fled Nazism at the time, and the first woman and not US-born citizen to lead US foreign affairs, warning for fascism today says, democracy is not the easiest form of government. It does require attention and participation and, a, and carrying out a social contract, and it doesn't deliver immediately. As Mario said this morning, we need a lot of creativity, I think, indeed, for democracy. Have we gotten through high-speed internet and online shopping, at least those who have access to that, so used to having things delivered immediately? Are we still ready to make efforts for rewards that may only wait along the road? Do we just have to try harder, speak out louder for the world, for you, for me, for our children? Do we have a choice? Or is it not the invisible others, but are we failing in our daily lives to be compassionate with a lot of others ourselves? I think it is worth paying attention to above-sighted events, if not only to be, to be aware that if one's freedom is limited, eventually the freedom of all is in danger. History has shown this many times. And to come back to festivals and festival managers, they all have platforms to act and react from. We can say, and we said it earlier today also, does a festival or a festival manager need to be loaded with the world's responsibilities? And I don't think so. They, have to be about art and artists in the first place. Fun also and festive, but connected to the world we live in and at least aware of who you share this feast with and who does not have access to it. In past years, we've made more determined steps with the Festival Academy to open up the ateliers to regions and fe festival managers less fortunate, raising funds for those who cannot afford to pay the fee. Having a first atelier in the Global South moving towards a more equal global conversation. We aim to have different perspectives, create a better understanding of the other, and to inspire current and future leaders, young and older people simultaneously, to help the next generation of festival leaders grow into alternative visions of a globalized world, incorporating the fundamental values that we've been talking about here also, um, like freedom of speech or human rights or you know, all the, the European values that we, that we stand for. Because we are all part of a group, we can be festival managers, you may be students, you know, um, we may share some of the same issues, being concerned with art or culture, but on a larger scale, we all have our identities or roots, which should be recognized. Nobody likes to be faceless. But if we consider terms as identity, we need to be very careful not to fall in the nationalistic trap of excluding certain people and views, even when unaware of it, through the social play field, which is dominated by a few. Am I, am I Short in timing, or can, yeah, because uh, I want to quote, and I have a few quotes, but it's just to challenge your thinking. Um, there's Fran Lebovic, who is an American author, and I want to quote what she has to say on race. The way to approach it, I think, is not to ask, what would it be like to be black, but to, serious, to seriously consider what it is like to be white. The owners, the people in charge, that's the advantage of being white, and that is the game. So by the time the white person sees the black person standing next to him at what he thinks is a starting line, the black person should be exhausted from his long and arduous trek to the beginning. 
And I have to say, with working also with Africa quite a lot now and doing this first edition there, the, the difficulties of the, the visa for people to travel there, the privilege that we have, you know, I think we have access to more than 150 pe countries where we can travel to freely. I think for an Afri African, which is already in a privileged position, maybe that's 50 or something. So there is really a, a huge inequality um, to face. But first and essentially, we are all part of the group of human beings. Some of us may be doctors or professors, and some may be ex have experienced more hardships than others or more successes. Some may speak more eloquently than others, but fundamentally, we all share the same human emotions. We are happy, delighted, joyful at times, lonely at times. So let's not be afraid of each other, but let's be aware and take care of each other. I think we get filled by life, by convictions, by skin color, by opportunities, by judgments, dogmas, experiences, houses, comfort, ideas, property, stuff, more stuff, opinions. And it's needed at times to challenge all we've learned and to unlearn and to challenge what we take for granted. <clears throat> There's a lot of uncertainty today, economically, politically, social, technologically, philosophically even, which is also sensed, I think, by the youth of today. And to be able to deal with this not knowing and to live here and now and to be aware of that is ever more important, I think. So that's what we try to do to inform also people about um, the context we work in today. And to give also a face to people who don't have access, like I, I said earlier with it in Sweden, we had this collaboration with the ICORN network through which some of the refugee artists took part in the program and for some of them it was like the best thing that happened to them in that year because you give them a face, a voice and connections, you know, which is really invaluable if you come from a completely different country or... Um, <clears throat> What is essential during the ateliers, I think, is to listen and to share, but especially to listen to each other, listening to stories of each other, but also stories and realities of these people who have been faceless, silenced, or homeless for too long. Um, and to be fragile and to recognize yourself and others in all colors. We all live on, in our own bubbles, but if you put that together and if you really take the time, like seven days, to open up, something happens. At the last atelier in Gothenburg, a lot of questions have been asked as, and it's again, just to give you some ideas, how to encourage those who encourage us? What can be done as festival activists in the spirit of solidarity, not pity? Find the artists who want to change the world. Artists are the best individuals to embrace equality. We turn to artists for things we don't understand. The urgency to destroy some of the mirrors we are looking in and to allow for angers at thing that, things that are not acceptable. To consider the political and social engagement of festivals next to the artistic engagement. The relation towards the community, the audience, as the artists. How to build more sustainable festivals, also taking future generations into account. And also the role of cities today, as we discussed, for example, which becomes sometimes more important than a nation for human encounter. We need to go beyond culture, beyond ourselves, to look at different ways of being. At the last atelier, and I think that's quite special, we've also, we also have been talking quite a lot about fear, uh, which is something which is very tangible in Europe today, I think. Fear of the other, fear of the unknown. Um, in terms of, again, politically, um, economically, in, in all these levels. Fear as in terms of audiences, uh, people, old, young refugees, poor, rich professors, hipsters, who are afraid to go to certain venues or festivals as they feel they don't belong there. The fear of time, the fear of being overconfident, the need to be humble, the fine balance between confidence and insecurity, believing in yourself, believing obstacles can be overcome, respecting the art scene which is not necessarily valued by many, the fear of being alone, the fear of what is to come in our world, the fear of not knowing. Maybe tomorrow we will all be refugees is, one of, is what one of the, the refugee artists said. Another one said, if I stop being afraid, I stop growing. Um, and I have something like, maybe fear is not on, 
only negative, but it points us also the, to what we don't know and what we need to learn, and maybe we have a responsibility to stay curious always. The fear of connection, the fear of freedom and choice, what we talked about this morning. But we need to keep on moving, we need to act. And what are we going to do with this potential? What happens the day after your festival ends? What happens the day after an atelier ends? Which actions will we take home after an atelier? What happens after the five days that end here? What are you going to do with the, the connections that you made and the knowledge that you gathered um, here? And I do believe in the power of the individual and these catalysts for, for change. And I can again, I can tell you what I will do, you know, to continue facilitating this global conversation and to strive for more equality in it by building partnerships, by creating opportunities for those less fortunate to participate in this and to, to create this, uh, yeah, um, network of activists. And I want to end um, with a thing like, I think also, you know, these five days that you spend here together, you get to know each other, you make connections, you maybe take home friends, so you're also, you're not alone in that. And that's really a great thing. We have a network of more than 500 people, which is a really powerful tool in today's world to, all these people have festivals and communities. And if you, if you look at the spillover um, effect of that, what they can do when they get back home, it's quite impressive. And I want to, to end with one other quote of uh, Shimamande Ngozi Adishi, which is a Nigerian writer. Um, and she says, now is the time to remember that in a wave of dark populism sweeping the West, there are alternative forms. Now is the time to counter lies with facts, repeatedly and unflaggingly, while also proclaiming the greater truths of our equal humanity, of decency, of compassion, Every precious ideal must be reiterated, every obvious argument made, because an ugly idea left unchallenged begins to turn the color of normal, and it does not have to be like this. I think that through this equal humanity, decency, and compassion, miracles could maybe happen, and who knows, we might end up with a better world. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much, Inge, and thank you for showing us this uh, great job um, you are doing in, in this academy, and um, also to show us uh, the the way the festivals uh, work in Europe and at the international level, and the opportunities uh, they offer, and how they really can uh, collect uh, all that cultural potential and canalize that into uh, something uh, more focused, no? uh, which I will say this into people, into people. I, I wonder, because you talk about this wish you have, I don't know if it is, it's a wish or it's already a reality, if it, if it is a wish, I think if I understood it right, about this, creating this uh, movement of global conversation and, and human connection, um, how are you going to make it? And um, which are the challenges you are facing that? Because it sounds great in the paper, but I can imagine uh, how is uh, the reality. So that is, that is one thing I will, I will like uh, to know. And then you also talk about uh, uh, the feeling mm, that many people, especially from no European countries have when they participate in these academies. Uh, like uh, having a great opportunity, uh, unique in their lives, um, giving them a lot of um, uh, possibilities to do new things. But I also wonder, because I know in the, in the academies you organize, you have people from other uh, countries that are no European Union countries, but you have also people from European Union countries, which is their feeling? And which is their feeling when they meet those people with uh, many different opportunities, possibilities, and even rights uh, they have? Uh, that is mainly my two questions I have. And 
maybe I don't know if you knew a little bit how works the world of festivals. I'm sure that many of you already were users of uh, festivals, but uh, you can see from the presentation of, of Inge that the, the world behind that is, is quite hard. And maybe something you didn't know, and I think it's one of the lessons we can learn from, from here, is that festivals are not just to produce fun and um, to sell tickets and to just enjoy free time, but nowadays, thanks to this kind of movements, festivals are becoming much more useful to society. So I leave the floor open for you reflection, and maybe you can answer these two questions. Yeah. Answer. It's a huge challenge. You see how tired I am? <laughs> <laughs> No, it, 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 is, it, it is a challenge, but it's also very inspiring. And it is partly a reality already, and it is partly a dream. I mean, the reality is that we have, um, we are doing it. You know, we, we, we are organizing the activities in different parts of the world. We have participants coming from all over the world. And we have partnerships, uh, different partnerships from uh, also all over the world, we have, for example, the Korea Arts Council who supports participants. We have collaborations with the Ministry of China. We have the National Arts Council South Africa. We have cultural institutes, main, the, the big European ones like Pro Helvetia, etc., who help also support from different regions where they work. Uh, we have a newly established partnership with the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture who is supporting uh, two people per edition. So that's actually, if, if you want to know how I want to realize that dream, I I think I'm doing it already and it will need time and step by step slowly to develop this further, this model which is, which is already working and to diversify. I mean, it's, the idea is really not to have um, um, <clears throat> an academy or a training coming from Europe to teach Africa or something. So that's why it's called a festival academy and not a European festival academy and why we initiate uh, where we set up this organization apart from the European Festivals Association which we are closely linked to of course but really to have an identity which is global and not linked to any nationality uh, to have again what what you saw from the Johannesburg edition what worked really well to they have the feeling they have an equal global conversation and with that I'm answering maybe already and we're of course also looking at Europe we are sponsored by Creative Europe we're talking with Erasmus Plus we're talking we're thinking thinking about launching a pilot uh, project, so there, with the Commission also we're, we're thinking if there is an interest for Europe to go globally, you know, if they want to, to, to have that, that label also, if they think that that can um, uh, help or, or improve some of the, or, or yeah, help seek solutions to some of the root, mm -hmm. uh, root problems, I think, root causes that is... Um, so th those discussions are going on, but to answer your second question, how do these people feel meeting um, these Europeans? I think... But it's more the opposite. How the European feels? How the European feels? Uh, participating, because you, you are saying that, for instance, people who are not European, they see like an opportunity, yeah. they see like a something that is giving them a lot, but what about Europeans participating? which are the, the expectations, because for them more or less things are a little bit more easier. But when they go to these uh, academies, uh, do they have the same feelings as the others? Are they in the same situation like the people that is not from but they are also they're, they're as much looking for inspiration and motivation to keep on going on, you know, also with challenges of, of decreasing budgets today in culture and festivals. I mean, they, it's easier, but they're also looking for alternative models, how to do it. And most of the time I have the feeling that they really, they learn a lot from these countries who <laughs> never had these opportunities even, you know, and who developed other... Uh, ways and methods of working which they can then, because it, it's not about um, uh, teaching again, it's really about um, getting inspiring uh, examples of things that you can then transcend to your, um, transport to your context. And it's different maybe, but it's it's something to, yeah, to, to not, 
to not walk the, the, the same trodden, well-trodden paths all the time, but to really think out of the box and, and find solutions for... Because uh, in Europe, for example, you have a lot of festivals who exist for many, many, many times, but who are really struggling with getting audiences, with opening up their audiences, with um, keeping their program sustainable, with not repeating the program from one European festival to another. So they're, they're also really looking at, at challenging their thinking. And, uh, and I think that's mainly, I, I don't really feel a difference between um, uh, participants who come from, when I mention these refugees, it's of course like, they get so many connections that it, the impact is huge in that moment. But also for the Europeans, it's, it's to, to meet people who work in Africa and to be able to set up collaborations and to have somebody there that you trust or from India or from... Because that's also the thing, you don't just sell a product, you work with artists, you work with people. So you need to have people who you can trust and rely on and, and share a sort of taste with to work artistically. Mm. If that answers a little bit, uh, yeah, a little question. Bit. Yeah, because uh, because you are focusing on the refugees and immigrants from other yeah. countries, so no immigrants, but our participants from other countries. Uh, I thought there was a difference in the in the way they they live this uh, between those who are coming from European countries and no European countries, but apparently it's the same. At the end, yeah. Uh, yeah, but also because of the way it is facilitate, facilitated and the way that they are, they are being given a voice. Because the, what I wanted to say before that was that the reason that we changed it and that we involve much more speakers also from uh, different continents and countries is because um, a few years ago in the ateliers you had people, you know, you had somebody coming from India or somebody coming from Africa and within the context of the, I don't know if you know the concept of Global North and Global South, but Global North is like the economic, it's, it's based on your GDP, so it's the economic economically more powerful part of the world and the global south is like everything which is uh, like South America, India and and sometimes you had people there, all the speakers came from the global north and the majority of the p participants also and then you had somebody sitting there who said like, you know, I, I'm not surprised about it but my colleagues can really not think from my perspective and conditions. They always shift back to, that, that's also what the statement about ethical funding is about. You know, if you you, you, you always think from your context and to step into somebody else's context and to really have more people participating from these countries and also have speakers who represent those people within that conversation is necessary to break through these patterns where you stay in your own bubble and, and mm -hmm. don't really think beyond it. But mm -hmm. it, it comes again from the idea that for me, it's about, you know, if you know somebody who is uh, from Yemen, for example, you, you may be more concerned about the conflict there and, and the challenges they are facing then. And the challenges that we are facing in the world today are really challenges which should be addressed globally. I, that's my opinion, eh? which is not something you can solve in Europe or in, in Asia or in, in America. It's, it's something where you have to, because refugees are, are migrating to, to different uh, parts of the world out, out of a need. You know, it's not because they want, it's really because they cannot live in the conditions where they live and this is going to, with climate change and, and whatever, so if you, this is not a problem of the refugee, this is a problem of us as human beings, I think, okay. which goes beyond borders. We have uh, some reactions over there, I think the micro is over here. Who was the finger? There. Um, hello, I'm Lucia Costa, and uh, congratulations for your speech. I wanted to know how do you create the networks with the other um, the artists and the other um, organizations? And I wanted also to know if you had any bad experience in the, all the um, festivals you did. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we see if there is any other reactions or comments from the audience? Not so far. Okay. Let's answer this one. 
Um, what, what was the, f the beginning of your question? Sorry. Hey, can you give her? Because I remember the bad experience, but uh, <laughs> the beginning was. Uh, How do you um, create the networks? Networks. But yeah. what do you mean exactly? The, net, the alumni network or the the relation with between artists, um, festival managers, politicians? Uh, relations and with foreigners, uh, artists and managers. So how, how a program like this work, it works is if we, for example, do this in Gothenburg or in Johannesburg or we prepare that like two years in advance. So we go there, we have a, a very tough prospection uh, and we, we work very closely together with our partner who also advises us um, on who to, to integrate. So it's on the one hand, it's a global conversation, but it's very much locally embedded with the people who are working there, the artists, the festival managers, um, the politicians, the people from tourism, etc. So th that's one uh, of the things. On a, on a bigger level now, with the idea of uh, the Academy for Global Change, as I said before, um, there is this initiative which brings together Minister of Cultures coming from the world. So that's something that we will start in 2021 in Chile, in South America, with the first edition, where we will mm -hmm. connect this atelier with the Cultural Summit, uh, bringing together, and then to have one moment where we we overlap. It's of course it's it's. It's a sort of introduction, you know, it's like uh, small moments, the concentration is really still on the group of 40, 45 people like you are working together and having discussions and um, debating about uh, issues and, and trying to make their, change their thinking or have them formulate their thinking during the seven days. But. I don't know if this answers uh, your question. Yeah. And then there is the network of the alumni, which is like the first global network of festival managers, we can say, uh, which is something that we also keep alive. So we invite them to the European Festivals Association yearly summit. Let's say that some 20, 30 people come, but it's from different ateliers, so they meet. We involve them also in our network. There are people who are of the alumni who are part of um, the FA label jury, so in, in different programs that we have or we invite them as speakers in the ateliers. We had now I think three alumni. So the circle is round and it, it continues. So we we make use also of these people um, to yeah. And they were have bad them. Bad experiences? Uh, yes, bad experiences during the, the ateliers you mean? Yeah, the, the, the thing I said before, for example, you know, the, the fact that people really don't feel uh, represented is for me a very bad experience if you try to facilitate a global um, uh, dialogue. So it, it's something that you need to be very careful about. We also, we, you know, you bring people together globally. We had in one atelier, we had an Israeli and a Palestinian who didn't talk mm -hmm. to each other. In the end, they did, but it, it's... Or, you know, sometimes you also, you have to be so aware of the context of all these different countries or people that sometimes it's very sensitive what you can talk about in terms of women rights also or in terms of so some issues are really, so, so we had experiences with that where it's, where it was really challenging, let's say, um, or where, where people felt really uncomfortable at a certain point and how to, to manage that and how to, to deal with that or to work in Shanghai, for example, where some, you know, like half of our speakers uh, did not turn up or came late because they actually did not want them to come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but nobody told us, but it's like the way that they then, or, you know, all of a sudden you have a panel debate and somebody is talking and they come and say in your ear, like, it's time for tea and you walk out of the room and you wonder where is the tea. Things like that. So it, it is very challenging to operate in a global world also because I'm also in my bubble, you know, and if I go to, to Shanghai, I'm, I'm also, I'm prejudiced. So to, to work together with um, a completely different culture is sometimes very challenging and very difficult. And I'm learning also in that, but I made many, many, many mistakes on that level also. But it's, uh, yeah. I think that is a uh, very uh, good uh, message, uh, maybe to finish this uh, this presentation and this this conversation about um, how difficult, even with experience, sometimes we have, it is 
to work at a global uh, level. And this is something we have to, to bear in mind. I mean, it's important to, to have uh, training academies like that one that teach us uh, about how to really deal with this new global uh, challenge uh, we live in. I mean, of course, at the beginning we were thinking always in the barrier and cultural uh, barriers and the language barriers and so on, but there is much more. Yeah. As you say, it's difficult to bring us ourselves from our own bubble in which we live. There is much more, if I can, there's much more and there is a lot hidden also. There's a lot you don't know about yourself. So it's really about awareness, you know, like about your blind spots, about how racist mm -hmm. you really are. It's, it's, and to learn in that and to, yeah, take that in consideration each time when you come into contact with another human being, basically, I think. Okay, I think this is the perfect sentence to, to finish this conversation and this, uh, let's say, academic uh, uh, season uh, for today. So a big clap to Inger. Mm -hmm.